Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, hosted by Organovo and presented by Dr. Shelby King, Senior Research Scientist at Organovo. My name is Tom Murphy. I'm the Director of Scientific Applications also here at Organovo. Before we get started, I wanted to remind everyone in the audience that we will address your questions at the end of the presentation. However, we encourage you to submit your questions as they come to you during the presentation by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. We will collect the questions and address as many as we can during the Q&A session. And with that, I'd like now to introduce Shelby King. Dr. King has spent more than eight years studying the impacts of 3D culture conditions on epithelial cell biology. In her role as Senior Research Scientist at Organovo, her research focuses on the use of additive manufacturing to create 3D culture systems for studying key questions in kidney physiology and toxicology, as well as cancer cell biology and the tumor microenvironment. Dr. Shelby King holds a PhD from Northwestern University in cell and molecular biology. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Shelby. Great. Thanks, Tom. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with everyone today. The work that we've been doing on creating a model of the proximal tubular interstitial interface. First, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, our company, Organovo. We were established in 2007 and went public in 2013. We are listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange under the stock symbol ONVO. We are based out of San Diego, California and have a little over 100 employees based here at this location. We have a very robust IP platform that includes 25 global patents with over 100 that are pending around the world. At Organovo, we have several areas of core expertise that we bring together to create novel human tissue models. We are very well versed in tissue bioengineering and using a variety of um, different engineering methods to both create and then maintain and promote key features of the tissues that we build. We leverage this experience to build novel human tissue models. Uh, both normal and diseased models, and then we also um, are well versed in evaluating these novel systems, both at the biochemistry level as well as at the histological level. Our core platform technology is based around the use of our proprietary 3D tissue printing system. So shown here in the middle, in the middle panel is one of our, um, our bioprinters, which is capable of depositing cells in a very highly organized, highly re reproducible way. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. We leverage all of this experience to build these novel human tissue models across a variety of different tissue types, both incorporating normal systems as well as different types of disease models. Access to this core expertise is provided primarily through our in vitro service arm. These are based around a few different options. We have a very robust profile in preclinical safety and ADME services, and this is operated as a fee-for-service type of business, where you gain access to our novel human tissue models uh, through a, an, an agreement uh, find around specific services to be provided. We also operate uh, in partnerships to create either disease models of a particular tissue that we may uh, have an interest in working in, or custom tissues to build new types of, of normal or disease tissues to fit your key research interest. We also have an arm of the company that's very much interested in in vivo R&D programs and building tissues for uh, biotherapeutic uses. And these, these projects are partnership uh, so that we can define the specific needs of the customer and then build tissues to suit. I wanted to talk a little bit more about our core technology. Uh, shown on the left, again, is our proprietary Novagen bioprinter platform. So our scientists can use this proprietary system to build 3D tissues through automated spatially controlled cellular deposition. As you can see on the 
the right are several examples of some of the tissues that we have built on site, including a full thickness model and different aspects of our 3D liver tissue uh, that demonstrate uh, the ability to better mimic native tissue structure and function through being able to control how and when these cells are interacting with each other. In order to bioprint our ex vive human tissues, we start with human cells. Most often we're working with primary human cells, but we have many different options available to us, including iPS-derived cells, and we can also work with cells from either normal tissues or diseased tissues if we would like to recapitulate specific aspects of a diseased tissue. These human cells are then prepared as NovaGel BioInc. So this is a mixture of different cell types, um, and these form small aggregates that are then mixed with proprietary media to support the different cell types in the BioInc, as well as a temporary matrix that facilitates uh, extrusion of these cells through the bioprinter system. Shown here again is our NovaGen bioprinter platform. Uh, this is very compatible with all types of biological materials, including uh, some cells that are normally very difficult to work with. This printer shown here has four different heads, which can deposit in a variety of different methods um, to, to very finely control where the cells are placed in relation to one another. The end result is a human tissue that is highly reproducible. So shown here is our 3D liver tissue printed as an array in a 24 well plate. This is very scalable. Um, the printing process itself is very rapid and we can generate large numbers of tissues in a very short time. And the end result is that the tissue is 100% cellular. There is no exogenous scaffold such as a polystyrene or other type of um, exogenous polymer that is remaining at the time of use. And shown here are some examples of some of the biolinks that we use where we can create tissues that are up to 100% cellular. All of this comes together to create tissues through automated spatially controlled cellular deposition that mimics native tissue structure and function. Now I'd like to dive into how we have gone about modeling the kidney proximal tubule and the creation of the ex vive human kidney tissue. The proximal tubule is a key area of interest for us as it's a major target of renal toxicity. This is due to a couple of different reasons. The proximal tubule here is located immediately downstream of the glomerulus and is exposed to high concentrations of potentially toxic materials following filtration of the glomerulus. Simultaneously, the proximal tubule epithelial cells are exposed to uh, other types of compounds through the blood supply via peritubular capillaries that wrap around the renal tubules. Our goal here was to be able to model key aspects of proximal tubule biology. Currently, there are very few 3D multicellular systems that can bridge one of the key functions of the proximal tubule, which is renal transport and excretion with the toxicity that can be observed in the clinic. Additionally, uh, epithelial monolayers, which are a wonderful gold standard in the field, uh, have challenges with modeling some complex disease states such as fibrosis in vitro. So our approach has been to design a 3D tissue to model the native human architecture, but to modify that architecture so that we can ask very targeted questions in this case, we have taken the proximal tubule and turned it into a laminar structure that is adaptable to a standard transwell cell culture insert. So shown here is a schematic where we have generated an interstitial layer composed of renal fibroblasts and endothelial cells that is deposited by bioprinting into a 24-well transwell cell culture insert. A layer, of polarized, sorry, a layer of proximal tubule epithelial cells is then added into the culture system, at which point it interacts with the bioprinted interstitial tissue to form uh, a tissue such as what you see on the right here, where we have a system that allows us to access both the apical portion of the culture system 
that is in primary contact with the epithelial cells, as well as being able to access the basolateral compartment underneath so that we can ask questions that are related to renal transport and excretion, as well as toxicity. I'd now like to walk you through some of the key features of the 3D kidney tissues. Shown here in panel A is an H&E uh, hematoxylin and eosin stain showing the interstitial layer of the tissue supporting a layer of polarized primary human proximal tubule epithelial cells. We see from this stain that we have nice cellular density here, but also quite a bit of collagen uh, deposition, as would be observed in vivo, surrounding the proximal tubules. The cell density is relatively low, as we would want to see. And when we confirm this using a trichrome staining for extracellular matrix, we see really nice ECM deposition surrounding endothelial cell networks that form in the middle of the interstitium, as well as supporting the primary proximal tubule epithelial cells. To confirm this with some cell type specific stains, we first looked at CD31 or PCAM staining as a marker of the endothelial cells in the tissue. And shown here in about the middle of the interstitial layer, we see nice CD31 lined structures uh, that are representative of endothelial cell networks and microvascular like structures that, are, uh, that demonstrate open lumens. And we believe that this is helping to support media exchange within the tissue and, and help to provide overall um, increased longevity of the tissue, as I'll discuss in just a moment. When we look more in depth at the epithelial compartment of the tissue, we see that by cytokeratin 18 expression, we have a monolayer of epithelial cells that covers the width of the tissue. And when we look closer, we see in green that E. cadherin localizes to the lateral junctions between the epithelial cells, and that this epithelial monolayer is supported by a collagen-4 rich basement membrane. Key here is that this basement membrane is created by the interplay between the interstitial cells and the epithelial cells, and is not due to any deposition of exogenous extracellular matrix. This is purely an interaction between the cells in the tissue. We also looked at some aspects of polarity and expression of renal transporters at the correct membrane location of the epithelial cells. Shown in the top panel here is the sodium potassium ATPase, and we see that it localizes to the basal lateral membrane of the epithelial cells of the tissue. We also looked at both xenobiotic and endogenous substrate transporters in our tissue, and we see here that PGP uh, an efflux transporter is expressed at the apical surface of the epithelial cells in the tissue. SGLT2, the sodium glucose, trans sodium glucose transporter, is also expressed at the apical surface of the epithelial cells in the tissue. Next, we wanted to look at overall health and longevity of the tissue um, over time and culture, as well as looking at epithelial-specific functions to ensure that they were maintained uh, over, over time and culture. So first we looked at the activity of the, of the gamma glutamyl transferase enzyme. This is an enzyme that is expressed at the apical surface of epithelial cells, not just in the proximal tubule. But here it's, it's involved in glutathione homeostasis as well as detoxification of certain xenobiotic compounds. So when we looked in our 3D kidney tissues, we see that GGT activity increases over time and culture. Um, and we have taken these tissues out longer than four weeks and are continuing to try to push the boundaries of how long we can keep these tissues in culture. As you see here by the blue line, our 3D tissues continue to exhibit um, increasing GGT activity as late as uh, about eight weeks in culture. With the interstitium alone, this is included as a negative control here. Uh, the red line shows very negligible activity as expected because GGT, the enzyme, is expressed only on the epithelial cells of the culture system. Next we looked at barrier function to be able to demonstrate that our tissues are exhibiting a selective barrier as would be observed in vivo. We did this in a couple of different ways. First on the left hand side, we used a classic Ussing chamber system to measure trans epithelial electrical resistance at culture day 21. 
shown here is a summation of 17 separate tissues. Looking at the resistance, uh, we see that the average Ohm's 10 centimeter squared is 15.9 for our 3D bioprinted tissues. When we compare this to historical values, both in vivo and in vitro, we see that our system most closely aligns with rat or dog proximal tubules in vivo. We see a striking contrast from either MDCK, LLCPK1, or human proximal tubule epithelial cell monolayers. These systems have epithelial cells that have been plated usually onto a transwell culture system. And when those values are measured, they tend to be much higher than what we observe in vivo or in our 3D bioprinted tissues. And this is potentially reflective of a few different things. Uh, the MDCK and the LLCPK1 cells, while commonly used for um, a variety of different endpoints in um, transport and excretion, are thought to come from farther down the nephron than the proximal tubule, where the junctions between the cells become tighter and tighter. For the human proximal tubule epithelial cell monolayer, these values again are much higher than what we observe, and this may be due to a lack of a physiologically relevant basement membrane, as the cells are, co are in contact with the polymer of the transwell membrane. Another way that we measured barrier function was to look at monolayer integrity over time and culture by measurement of passive permeability using the dye Lucifer Yellow. So here, each dot represents measurements from an individual tissue. We see a, an overall decrease in passive permeability, indicating that the tissues are decreasing in that measurement and becoming a little bit more tighter over time. Um, the dotted line is representative of a passive permeability value of 1 times 10 to the minus 6 centimeters per second, which is more indicative of what you would see of an epithelial-only monolayer. And so our cultures um, are consistent between the Lucifer yellow passive permeability measurement and the tier values, which is indicating that these tissues are forming a little bit of a leakier barrier than you would, than you would observe with an epithelial monoculture and more reflective of what you would see in vivo in the proximal tubule. Next, we looked at the function of a couple of different key transporters in our 3D kidney tissues. First, we looked at SGLT2, the sodium glucose transporter. So this is one, one method by which glucose can be reabsorbed back into the epithelial cells from the glomerular filtrate. So here, SGLT2 is expressed on the apical surface of the epithelial cells, and we confirmed this histologically as I showed a few moments ago. So here, we starved our tissues overnight and then used insulin to induce glucose uptake via, via several different mechanisms. However, we used the SGLT2-specific inhibitor, canagliflozin, to see if we could block that insulin-mediated glucose uptake. So shown here, is a 2-deoxyglucose assay. 2-DG is a glucose analog that is taken up into the cells but then cannot be further broken down. So it accumulates in the cells and we can use a standard colorimetric assay to detect the amount of 2-DG accumulation in the tissues. So here when the tissues are starved, um, there is very little 2-DG um, that, is, that is present. When we add that along with insulin stimulation to encourage the cells to take out glucose, we see a significant increase in the amount of 2-DG that accumulates in the tissue. When those tissues are co-treated with canagliflozin, the SGLT2-specific inhibitor, we see a reduction to levels that are indistinguishable from the control, indicating that at least part of the glucose transport that is occurring in the tissues is mediated by the SGLT2 co-transporter. Next, we looked at PGP efflux. This is a key transporter uh, that is very much of interest in uh, a variety of different types of studies looking at how uh, drugs are processed in the kidney and, and how that may lead to nephrotoxicity. So here we use the fluorescent substrate rhodamine-123 or R123. Um, it's thought that there are uh, several different mechanisms of uptake into the tissues, but one of these is mediated by the organic cation transporter OCT2. Once R123 is in the cell, it can then be effluxed via the PGP efflux transporter on the apical surface. So here, we loaded the tissues with rhodamine-123 in the presence or absence of the PGP zosiquidar. 
Looking at fresh frozen sections of our tissues, we can see in the epithelial layer, rhodamine 123 specifically accumulates as punctate fluorescent dots in the epithelial cells of the tissue. Upon inclusion of zosuquidar, the PGP inhibitor, we see that that fluorescent substrate is trapped in the epithelium. We can then quantify this and we see that inclusion of the PGP efflux inhibitor uh, causes a statistically significant accumulation of the rhodamine-123 fluorescent substrate in the tissues, indicating that we are blocking, when we block this efflux transporter, we are able to trap the dye in the cells as we would expect. I'll pause here to summarize the basic features of our 3D kidney model. Uh, I want to emphasize that we have created an interstitium composed of renal fibroblasts and endothelial cells that supports the viability and functional functionality of human primary proximal tubule epithelial cells. This culture is maintained for well over 28 days and we are continuing to push the boundaries of how long we can keep these tissues in culture. The tissues demonstrate evidence of key physiologically relevant features of the proximal tubule, including demonstration of in vivo-like barrier function as measured by trans epithelial electrical resistance and passive permeability measurements. We see renal transporter expression, and we have validated the function of SGLT2-mediated glucose transport and PGP-mediated efflux of rhodamine 123. Our next question was whether we could use this system to investigate nephrotoxicity and key mechanisms of nephrotoxicity. So today, I'll present two case studies focused around cl the classic nephrotoxins, amphotericin B and cisplatin. First, I'd like to walk through some of the studies that we've done with amphotericin B. This is an antibiotic that binds to lipids in the plasma membrane of fungi as well as epithelial cells. Shown here are two mechanisms that are thought to contribute to the nephrotoxicity observed with this compound. It's thought that amphotericin B facilitates formation of pores in the plasma membrane that then results in leakage of cellular contents, and this may be due to binding to specific lipid components within the plasma membrane. In order to study amphotericin B-induced nephrotoxicity in our 3D bioprinted kidney tissues, we took our XV human kidney tissues and, do, and exposed them daily for seven days to different doses of amphotericin B. These tissues were dosed both to the basolateral compartment of the transwell system as well as to the apical compartment to ensure that we were getting even exposure throughout the different cell types of the system. We measured several different endpoints, including Alamar blue reduction to measure overall tissue metabolic activity. We looked at GGT activity as a measure of epithelial specific function in the system. We measured two different, micro, bio, two different biomarkers uh, from the supernatants of the tissue. And then we also looked at histology uh, to be able to evaluate any cell type specific effects we might be observing in the system. So first, we looked at Alamar blue reduction. So here, uh, we have increasing doses of amphotericin B. And Alamar blue, um, is going to measure overall metabolic activity. So this is going to assess the metabolism of the interstitial cells of the tissue as well as the epithelium. We see a slight but significant reduction in overall tissue viability at only the highest dose of amphotericin B of 30 micromolar. However, when we look at GGT activity, which is specific to the epithelial cells of the tissue, we see a nice dose-dependent reduction in G GGT activity, indicating that we may be observing epithelial-specific toxicity. It's interesting here that we're observing this nice dose-dependent decrease in epithelial toxicity, but this doesn't necessarily correlate with overall metabolic activity reduction. And this may have to do with the relative proportion of cells um, in the overall tissue. The epithelial cells are a monolayer, whereas the interstitial, the interstitial portion of the tissue is several cell layers thick, and it and approximates about 100 microns in overall thickness. So there are, more, there are more interstitial cells present than epithelial cells, and thus uh, we may not see an overall reduction in overall tissue metabolic activity here. 
When we look at two different biomarkers, we see a dose and time dependent release of these biomarkers into the apical supernatant of the tissue. So first we looked at lactate dehydrogenase release, LDH, and we see that the highest doses of amphotericin B um, are relieved, cause a release of LDH that is very robust very early, but then tapers off as the cells are no longer able to respond. Um, with the lower doses of amphotericin B, we see a delay in the response, um, and this is particularly observed with uh, NAG, or N-acetyl beta d glucosaminidase. This is an enzyme, again, that is specific to epithelial cells in, the, um, in our kidney tissues and has been shown to correlate with a variety of different nephrotoxins. So here we are able to, to use uh, different biomarkers to correlate with the epithelial toxicity that we observe by GGT activity reduction. Next, we looked histologically at our tissues across the different doses tested. So here in the vehicle, you see healthy interstitial tissue with nice open endothelial cell networks, and we're retaining our polarized monolayer of epithelial cells. With increasing doses of amphotericin B, we're seeing a very dramatic effect on the epithelial cells, with a flattening of the epithelium, loss of nuclei, and an overall uh, destruction of the epithelial layer of the tissue. However, the interstitial tissue remains viable with endothelial cell networks and healthy fibroblasts throughout. I'd next like to discuss cisplatin-induced nephrotoxicity. Uh, this is another classic gold standard nephrotoxin that we wanted to use to validate our system and its ability to demonstrate key aspects of nephrotoxicity. Cisplatin is an anti-cancer compound that's taken up by the proximal tubule epithelial cells by at least two different uptake transporters, OCT2 and the copper transporter CTR1. Once in the epithelial cells, cisplatin can be processed through a variety of mechanisms that leads to uh, many different types of damage within the epithelial cells. At low doses of cisplatin, these enzyme systems that are involved in detoxification are very efficient and efflux through a variety of different apically expressed efflux transporters can prevent toxicity. However, at higher doses, the system is less functional. Cisplatin can accumulate within the epithelial cells and lead to toxicity. To evaluate this in our system, we use the XVP human kidney tissues dosed daily for seven days with cisplatin to either the apical or, I'm sorry, to both the apical and the basolateral compartments of the transwell tissue system. We also included the OCT2 inhibitor cimetidine to evaluate whether blocking uptake into the epithelial cells by one of the key uptake mechanisms could reduce toxicity. We again looked at some key endpoints, looking at overall tissue viability and metabolic activity by Alomar Blue, epithelial specific GGT activity, as well as release of biomarkers and histology of the tissues following exposure to cisplatin. So here, we see a striking contrast to what we observed for amphotericin B. When we look at overall metabolic activity of the tissue, we see a very nice dose-dependent decrease uh, of Alomar blue reduction with increasing doses of cisplatin. This is similar to what we observe when we look at epithelial-specific GGT function. And for both of these, the LD50 of cisplatin in the system is right around 5 micromolar. We next co-administered cimetidine to block OCT2-mediated uptake of cisplatin. And we see, when we look at Alomar blue reduction in the system, the vehicle control and the cimetidine only control exhibit very comparable levels, indicating that we're not observing any off-target effects here with our OCT2 inhibitor. When we dose with 5 micromolar cisplatin, we've reduced the overall tissue viability by about 50%. And when cimetidine is included with 5 micromolar cisplatin for the 7 days of dosing, we see a rescue of viability to nearly 100% and levels indistinguishable from that of the vehicle or cimetidine only control. 
we observe a similar effect looking at the GGT activity, which is specific to the epithelial cells. So again, 5 micromolar cisplatin reduces the GGT activity by almost 50%. And then this is almost completely rescued by the inclusion of the OCT2 inhibitor, cimetidine. When we look at the biomarkers, LDH and NAG, we see uh, something that correlates very nicely with the LMR blue and GGT activity that we observed, where we see a dose and time dependent release of LDH that is completely rescued by inclusion of cimetidine in the system. We see that with uh, NAG, we see a similar system in which um, the, the high and mid-level doses of cisplatin are, in, are inducing this release of this biomarker and inclusion of cimetidine almost completely suppresses that biomarker release. When we look at the histology of the tissues, we see that the vehicle and the cimetidine treated tissues look very similar where we have a healthy interstitium supporting a polarized epithelium monolayer. Cisplatin, as we would expect, we see an effect on, on, the, on the epithelium as well as the interstitium. In the epithelium, we see aberrantly shaped nuclei, we see flattening of the cells and loss of cellular organization, and loss of some nuclei is exhibited here. In the interstitium, uh, we see an overall uh, slight reduction in cell number and viability. And this correlates nicely with the observed Alamar blue reduction as well as the GGT activity reduction. When we include cimetidine, we see a nice rescue of both the interstitium and the epithelium, where many of these epithelial cells are now returned to a more columnar shape with nice, healthy, round, basally positioned nuclei. And we've been able to restore the cell density within the interstitium. One of the key features of the proximal tubule is the ability to respond to, in, to injury and its capacity for compensation. So this is dependent on the level of injury. Um, in our system, we wanted to be able to, to investigate if we destroyed a portion of the epithelial cells, could they then respond by proliferating to heal uh, the gaps in that monolayer uh, through a variety of different mechanisms. So, in order to evaluate this, we, we looked at the compensatory proliferative response to cisplatin injury in our 3D kidney tissue systems. So here we're looking at PCNA, proliferating cell nuclear antigen, stained in green here. Um, and in our control tissues, we see a very low level of proliferation with the epithelial monolayer observed here. With increasing doses of cisplatin, we see an increase in the number of epithelial cells that are proliferating, as indicated by these white arrows here. So at 2.5 micromolar cisplatin, which is below that LD50 dose of cisplatin, we see a minor response. This increases at 5 micromolar cisplatin, indicating that the cells are trying to recover and repair the damage induced by cisplatin. And when cimetidine is co-administered, this uh, proliferative activity uh, is blocked which correlates nicely with uh, the data that we observed with regard to uh, the biomarkers that are released and the ability of cimetidine to block that, as well as the overall restoration of tissue viability and epithelial-specific activity when cimetidine is included in the culture system. So today I've presented two case studies using gold standard nephrotoxins to validate our ex vivo human kidney tissue. Some of the key features here is that we've included primary human cells so that we can observe the functional interplay between the different cell types in the system. Here, the interstitial layer serves a very important role, which is to support the continued expression and function of natively expressed human proteins. In particular, renal transporters is preserved for greater than 28 days in culture. This also allows us to be able to study the interplay between these key cell types. So we can look at how a compound impacts the epithelial cells, but also as that tissue undergoes remodeling, damage, we can look at what the downstream effects are on the, end, on the endothelial cells as well as the fibroblasts to be able to model 
some complex disease phenotypes, including renal fibrosis. We have retained many aspects of the relevant tissue architecture, which enables studies of both chronic and acute dosing and investigation of histologic phenotypes at the same time as biomarker release and other aspects of um, other biochemical effects on the tissue are being observed. So we've created a tissue that enables us to recapitulate clinically relevant phenotypes in vitro. We're continuing to explore this system. Our key areas of interest currently are around continued validation of key renal transporters in this system using mass spec based detection of small molecules following vectorial or directional transport in this system. Because many of these renal transporters are expressed at the endogenous levels and are maintained over time in our system, we hope to be able to correlate transport with the toxicity that is dependent on the function of those key renal transporters, including the organic anion transporters, OAT1 and 3, OCT2, as well as key efflux transporters, including PGP, MRP4, and other key um, transporters such as the MATE system. All right, with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Please submit your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. Thank you, Shelby. Um, so now we'll begin the Q&A segment of the webinar. <clears throat> As Shelby mentioned, um, if you haven't already, please submit your questions through the questions pane in the attendee control panel. Um, and so that we can make sure to address your question. So let's get started. So we fielded a few questions here. Why don't we start with some of the technical questions that came in. Uh, one of those questions is, how long does it take to print a well? So it's actually a very rapid process. Um, I'd say to print an entire 24 well plate takes us approximately 20 minutes. Um, and so often we'll print multiple 24 well plates at any given time. Um, there is a little bit of legwork that goes into preparing the cells beforehand, but overall, uh, it's a very it's a very rapid, very reproducible process. Okay. Um, another uh, technical question here: Why use a bioprinter to create the tissue versus just making the epithelial layer by manual means? That's a great question, and one I actually hear quite a bit. Um, so when we first began um, attempts to create this tissue. We came at it from a very agnostic process. Uh, so I, I tried a variety of different steps, including a simple assembly of the interstitial cell types into collagen gels, uh, or just simply putting um, a co-culture together and, and adding it to the wells. And the, the real challenge here is around the renal fibroblasts. So in vivo, the, the cell layer surrounding the proximal tubule is actually very thin, but there's a really nice band of collagen that's deposited there. Unfortunately, those renal fibroblasts carry that over into an in vitro system. And we found that in the absence of using the bioprinter, the renal fibroblasts deposited so much coll collagen that it caused the tissues to contract. And we were no longer able to maintain a flat laminar type structure. So with the bioprinter and some of the additional um, expertise that we have on site, we were able to create a tissue that retains the cells in the orientation in which they're deposited at the time of printing, and then we can maintain those tissues as flat laminar structures for quite a long time in culture. Okay, um, another technical question here. What kind of bioinks are you using? Are they reabsorbed or replaced completely by cells? Um, the bioink formulations, the specific formulations um, and compositions is proprietary, but Shelby, perhaps you could speak as to you know, what's the fate of the bioinks after the tissue is manufactured? Sure. Um, as Tom mentioned, um, a lot of this is proprietary, but I will tell you that the particular um, bioinks that we're using in the, in the bioprinted kidney system actually dissolve uh, very shortly after, um, after facilitating the deposition of the material at the time of printing. And so within just um, really even a few hours, that material has gone away, which is what we have tuned the system in order to be able to do. Because we really wanted that hydrogel and those bioinks are there to help support the cells as they are deposited by the printer, 
But we want that to go away as quickly as possible so that the cells can find each other and begin interacting, begin depositing their own extracellular matrix. Thank you. Um, okay, I got a couple more questions here about some of the other non-epithelial cell types uh, to address. Um, one question here, what is the role of renal fibroblasts? Did you try the same models without fibroblasts? That's a really interesting question. Um, so here we think that the fibroblasts are helping to provide overall structure and support to the tissue. They're likely also playing a key role in creation of that basement membrane that we believe is allowing those primary proximal tubule epithelial cells to be maintained in such a nice functional state for so long in culture. So one of the challenges with primary isolates of proximal tubule from the kidney is that um, plate amounts of plastic, those begin to de-differentiate very quickly and um, lose their epithelial morphology, lose their epithelial characteristic pretty quickly in culture. Um, we did actually investigate some other cell types in this system that found that um, that extracellular deposition by the renal fibroblasts was really key to creating the system. Uh, so a related question here, have you looked for activity of other toxicants, such as those that would be expected to induce toxicity directed to cells in the interstitium, such as the endothelial cells or the fibroblasts, as opposed to the epithelial cells? Uh, the short answer to that is yes. Um, those studies are actively ongoing. Um, we're very much interested in being able to recapitulate aspects of renal fibrosis that is drug-induced. And so we have some ongoing studies looking at some uh, well-known fibrosis-inducing compounds, including aristolochic acid and tacrolimus, and being able to um, evaluate both biochemically and histologically that we're seeing um, clinically relevant markers of renal fibrosis. Good. Okay. Uh, some questions now on transporters. Um, question here, do you have any indication of other transporter expression, such as the OCTs, OATS, or MATES, which are important for DDIs and kidney toxicities? Yes. So this is, this is our key area of interest currently, and how we are approaching this is to look at mass-spec-based mass detection of these transporters in our 3D kidney tissues. Uh, here we want to be able to demonstrate that the level of expression of those transporters is comparable to what is observed in the native kidney. Those studies are ongoing and are looking very, very promising. And then our next step will be to validate the function of those transporters by looking at, at movement of small molecules um, through directional transport assays, again looking at mass-spec-based mass spec detection of those small molecules. Okay, so a related question here. Um, do you guys run any internal controls prior to the start of the experiment to ensure that the kidney transporters are working as they should uh, for the efflux and uh, uh, influx or uptake? Absolutely. We have a very robust uh, QC process for our tissues, um, and, and that is a particular, uh, we know how important the renal transporters are and that their continued function is occurring to be able to model accurately nephrotoxicity. So the short answer to that is, is yes, absolutely. That is something that we evaluate um, to make sure that that function is maintained over time. Okay. Question here now on uh, disease modeling. Have you tested the ability of disease-relevant stimuli, for instance, hypoxia or hyperglycemia, to modulate the phenotype of the cells in the system? Have you looked at fibrotic endpoints? Thank you for that question. Um, that is also another uh, very, very active area of interest for us. Uh, so in terms of disease modeling, in addition to fibrosis, um, where we're, we're primarily currently taking um, an approach to look at drug fibrosis, uh, some of the other aspects of disease modeling that we're interested in in the proximal kidney is being able to, or sorry, the proximal tubule model is to be able to look at, for instance, diabetic nephropathy and some of the endpoints that you might observe in the proximal tubule there. And so looking at the influence of sugar balance, um, of um, oxygen tension, things like that, is, that they're very intriguing questions uh, and ones that we hope to be able to answer soon. All right, um, some questions around cell sourcing. One question here is, 
what is the source of the renal fibroblasts. And uh, kind of a, a, a little bit of a longer question here, which is, can you tell me about how the cells which go into the kidney tissue are sourced? Do you see variation donor to donor? And how do you control for that? Sure. So all of these cell types that go into our bioprinted kidney are primary human cells. And we're very fortunate to be able to work with our subsidiary company, Samsara Biosciences, in order to have access to extremely high quality, um, transplant quality organs from which our cells are sourced. Um, and so to that extent, uh, the system is somewhat tunable. So we do have a variety of different donors that we, that we evaluate for expression of key drug metabolizing enzymes as well as renal transporters so that we can uh, control what goes into the system and so that we can either look at a single donor and do a very deep dive into how, um, how different compounds are processed in that tissue or we can look across a variety of donors to see if there are differences with regard to compound handling. Good. Okay. Um, one question here, um, wanting to get more clarity as the, to the results of the two nephrotoxicants that were shown, cisplatin and infotericin B. Um, this person noted that for cisplatin, GGT and the metabolic activity by LMR Blue both decreased after exposure to cisplatin, but with amphotericin B, there was an, only a decrease in GGT that was seen. So could you help explain kind of the mechanism or your thinking behind why there was that different pattern between the two compounds? Sure. So in this case, the ability to do histology uh, in, in our system becomes very key. So when we looked at the tissues that had been treated with cisplatin, we saw a very striking effect uh, first on the epithelium, but also on cell types within the interstitium, which correlated with that reduction in overall tissue metabolic activity by LMR blue, as well as the loss of GG GGT activity that we observed. When we looked at the HNE for the amphotericin B treated tissues, we saw that while the epithelial cells had been almost completely denuded, the interstitium was largely very healthy. Um, and all of those, uh, both of those interstitial cell types were retained uh, and, were, and looked very viable. So what we think is happening there is that the infotericin B um, is, is very specific for the epithelium, particularly at the doses that we tested. And we're seeing that loss of epithelial specific function, but not an overall loss of function in the interstitial tissue. And the challenge there is that the interstitial tissue makes up more of the tissue mass than the epithelial cells do. And so when you measure that global tissue activity, that may be skewed toward the interstitium. And that's why we use the GGT activity to go in and have a really nice specific metric of what's going on in the epithelial cells because they are a smaller portion of the tissue than the interstitium. Um, so another question uh, around cisplatin. What happens to the tissue if you dose it with cisplatin and then remove the toxic stimulus, is the kidney tissue able to regenerate and repair itself? So this is something else that we're also um, very much interested in investigating. And key here is choosing the correct dose. So we know from our initial studies that our LD50 value is around 5 micromolar. So we would predict that if you go much higher than that, you're going to have such an overall loss of tissue health and loss of the epithelial cells that they may not be able to overcome that damage to repopulate the monolayer. But if you're working in that LD50 range or even slightly lower than that, um, we do see very robust proliferation and we would expect that the tissue would recover. And so to answer that, we could give a single dose of, the, of cisplatin, withdraw that, and then see how long it takes for the tissues to recover. Or if they are able to recover, better in the absence of a stimulus or if we give another compound, um, if we can inhibit that, uh, that uh, regenerative response. Okay, another question from the audience. Are there plans to add fluid flow to your system? This might alter the phenotype of the cells. Great question. So there's been a, a lot of really, really beautiful work done on some proximal tubule models in um, a variety of microfluidics devices, kidney on a chip. Um, and here the goal is to induce a laminar flow of liquid similar to what would occur in the tubule in vivo um, to be able to stimulate the epithelial cells 
um, specific signaling pathways to help simulate their correct polarization and function of um, key epithelial features. Uh, so we have, we have access to a wonderful um, platform systems group here that does a lot of our bioengineering and is able to create custom fluidics devices for us. Um, one of the challenges that we have is the size of our tissues. So these tissues are approximately 3 millimeters by 3 millimeters by 100 microns. And so this is larger than what you're going to find in a microfluidics chip. And so our platform systems group is really pushing the boundaries of how we can, how we can bring in meaningful fluidics into the system and be able to see how that impacts how the tissues respond to different toxicants, as well as how that impacts their, their baseline uh, physiological fun functions. Great. Well, thank you, Shelby. Um, that's all the time that we have for our webinar today. Please look for our follow-up email with a link to view the recording of today's web once available on our website, organovo.com. I would also like to point out that we offer the XV human kidney tissue model through our tissue test. If you're interested in, in exploring this further, please check out our website. On behalf of Shelby, as well as our whole team here at Organovo, we thank you for tuning in. Have a great rest of your day.